Hey, what's going on, Wealth Warriors? We're back. Obstacles, the opportunity. We're here live from Thailand, Phuket. So today we're going to be talking about Tesla, and I'm going to actually going to do more videos about Tesla because it's just a lot of information in the media, and I think it's a wonderful company. Whether you decide to invest on your own accord is your choice, but I do love talking about Tesla and the things they have going on. So we're going to open it up with the actual video, and then we're going to get into the quarterly updates and go over the actual nuts and bolts pertaining to the company. But here we go. A few years ago, my son, who is an electrical engineer, was interning at Tesla. Dad, why don't you own some Tesla? I work there as an intern, and I said, I want to short that stock. It's such a joke. It's a car company trading at a ridiculous price. He said, no, you're the joke. You don't understand what Tesla does. I work there. It's not a car company. It's a data company. Every mile a Tesla drives, it goes into the database of mapping for autonomous cars. And I thought, shit, I didn't know that. He said, no kidding. You have a ton of money. Why don't you buy some of this stock? So just before I went on the air, I took my phone out and I bought a whack of the stock in my personal account. And I forgot about it. <laughs> One day I opened up the thing and I was up like a thousand percent a few years ago. Bam, a thousand percent. Now, I don't mainly talk about investing in the company just so your portfolio could be up a thousand percent. But what we do talk about is the fundamentals, especially it was great that he had a son that worked at Tesla. So he was able to provide some inside information beyond his understanding of where the stock was and what the company is about. And so majority of people actually don't understand what Tesla is about. And that's where they lack in understanding the current market value for Tesla and the potential in the future. And so that's what we want to bridge the gap between. Right. So we're going to come back to it and basically talk about it a little bit. But I want to jump ago, into the quarterly actual earnings. But before I do that, let's let's hear it one more time. Son, who is an electrical engineer, was interning at Tesla. Dad, why don't you own some just interning Tesla? I worked there as an intern and I said, I want to short that stock. It's such a it's such a joke. So he didn't say I want to short that stock because and then blank, blank, blank for details. He said, I want to short that stock because it's a joke. And this is a mistake that a lot of investors can make. Even one of the seasoned individuals like Kevin, not knowing about the company and knowing about it in detail, but only knowing possibly what he knows and what he hears from the media about Tesla being a joke. It is classified underneath a car manufacturer, right? And so therefore, it can only do things related to cars. In, in comparison of OME, that means, of course, GM, Ford, and et cetera, how can it be valued by so much? It's a car company. But once again, this is the lack of understanding of the details about Tesla and why it would demand such a large market value if it's only a car company. And even on the lines of it being a car company, it is one of the only car companies that has been successful for decades. There hasn't been a successful auto manufacturer in the United States for a very long time. And Tesla is one of the only ones so even outside of its accomplishment of actually becoming a successful car company that is not a legacy car company, but a new startup in comparison, it's done great for itself. But once again, you must know the finer details. And he wasn't sure of those finer details. So when you're investing in any company, you guys have to know about the company, not what people are saying. Hey, well, it's classified as this. So how can its P.E. ratio be so much and how can its value be so much in the other industries and in other companies are only valued as much as this in those companies I'm familiar with. But he was not familiar with Tesla. Such a joke. It's a car company trading at a ridiculous price. He said, no, you're the joke. You don't understand what Tesla does. I and that's the good part. No. You're the joke. Shout out to the son for actually being able to say that to his dad. But he was able, especially his dad, right, having that perceived value. I don't know if anybody else in the industry could say it to him. And so he said, no, you're the joke because you fail to understand. And so it's funny. It's projection. The individuals that say that company is a joke 
Well, it comes out that they're the actual joke because they lack understanding. Now, if they have an understanding about why they're shorting the stock, then that is room for debate. I work there. It's not a car company. It's a data company. Every mile a Tesla drives, it goes into the database of mapping for autonomous cars. I- now, beyond that, which does happen, all the data goes back to the neural network and collectivizes this massive amounts of data that could be utilized in the new techniques of machine learning, right, that we're seeing in chat GDP or any other type of machine learning and techniques that are devised. But it needs data. It needs information. It needs equations. It needs algorithms. It needs sand text. It needs human language, for an example, in order for the machine learning to be able to evolve, to be able to adapt, and hopefully one day achieving full self-driving, right? And so with that being said, Tesla has massive amounts of data. A lot of other companies, and even the closest company being Mobileye, slightly different perspectives and utilize different technologies like LiDAR, et cetera, to achieve the objective of real world artificial intelligence. And that's a big difference. Not only just is it a data company, it's a data company that is collectivizing real world artificial intelligence. So it is not an application that you place a paragraph in and ask it to come up bullet points or come up with bullet points from the web in order for you to finish out your homework assignment or something that's due at your corporation. Actually, solving artificial general intelligence encompasses that the computer has the understanding and the capabilities to move in the real world, to be able to navigate, to be able to drive safer than the average human. And so that is a big difference and something of tremendous value. So it is a data company of a specialized, specific type of data. And this data is real world driving. And so let's move away from this and let's move towards the actual quarterly report. Because once again, it's about how the company is performing that we want to evaluate, right? We want to understand the macro of what's available in the economy and the macro when it comes down to this actual company. But when it comes to Tesla, this is the conversations that we're having. So if we look, we're going to be going over the highlights. We're not going to go over the whole entire thing. Now, as you see, profitability, it's a 7.6 operating margin in quarter three. Now, this has been down tremendously, not by a large margin, but by a little bit. And this has been driving a bunch of people crazy. But at the end of the day, placing it back into the macro, it is outbeating the rest of OMEs and also the rest of companies that operate in manufacturing of cars. And so our main objective remains unchanged, unfazed in quarter three, 2023, reduced in cost per vehicle, cash flow generation, while maximizing delivery volumes and continued investment in AI and other growth projects. What I love about Tesla is that when you do the investor days, or if you have the AI day or battery day, these actual events actually dig into the details about specifically what is changing with the company, right? What are they changing? What are they making? Or what are they actually shooting for and what direction they're going and they spell it out for you so you can see everything of how are they going to reduce the cost per vehicle and so if you watched the previous i believe it might have been battery day or investors day tesla they spoke about how they're actually going to go about this how are they actually going to reduce the purchase price of the vehicle let's actually step away from this for a bit And I want to just show you guys a a snippet of the video um, so you guys can see about what are they talking about? How are they reducing the cost per vehicle? Um, Is this really happening? So let me go ahead and cut to the video. So here we go right here. This is in the investor day in 2023. And actually after this investor day, the stock didn't go up much, but it never really does when they actually have investor day, battery day, AI day because the market really doesn't interpret the presentation well, right? If there's not a big shiny car coming out, they don't really see the value. But in here, they're talking about the powertrain, right? 
And so how are they going to reduce the budgets? How are they going to make it more efficient and effective? How is it be going to perform better in the class of small SUVs, right? Um, if you move on here to this point, let's just see if I can actually get it right here. Efficiency helps us scale. So as you see, the Model 3 powertrain from 2017 to 2022, right? It went from 20% lighter drive unit and then 25% less rare earth materials and then 75% smaller powertrain factory, and then 65% cheaper powertrain factory. And so you see over the years, they're able to have efficiency increase. And this is a factor that you don't see in a lot of companies, right? They don't break down the car like this. As you see, here's another example. We're going to the electrical architect, right? And so as you look at the car from the Model S to the Model 3, right? You see that, oh, I can't zoom in, but they're improving low voltage architecture, right? So they're changing how many or how much materials they need. If you look at the actual view on the left side, you'll see that when it comes to the screen and all the electronic components right there at the dashboard, there seems to be more. But when you go and move over to this Model 3, it seems to be way less. And this is their objective to reduce the amount of electrical architecture and reduce the points of error and complications. So if there's less pieces, then there's less errors and room for error. And then also it costs less. And then also errors cost you money. And so it's a saving technique that most companies don't break down. Most GM, Ford are not breaking down their assembly line challenging the of traditional assembly line and then also challenging the architect or the design or the construction the manufacturing of a car like tesla does so it's not just tesla's tesla it's actually tesla's very effective and efficient at reducing costs reduce cost of model three and y center display and so even down to the display from 2017 all the way to 2023 the cost has been down considerably right? As you see right here on the left side, the weight has been reduced considerably right here in the middle. The power of the train, right, has also been reduced, right? Power W, 27, 24, 18. So how many watts or how much power does it need to actually be utilized? And so they're also perfecting that. I mean, this is just genius. This is, this, this is, this is the innovation right here. As you see, further improving low voltage architecture. So even in the Cybertruck that is going to be releasing soon, hopefully, you see that they're looking to what? Improve it, right? Reduce the amount of voltage. What does that do? The lower voltage, and it still operates when it was higher voltage required previously, reduces the amount of energy that is coming from the battery, which increases what your ability to use the energy for other things like driving i mean like guys come on relentless improvement via updates and data signals so this is the software side abilities to inform countless design decisions in both software and hardware yeah one example is that we were able to monitor and track the use of the sunroof in our cars and found that our customers never use their sunroof so we, we made an easy decision to remove it very barely yeah we haven't had sunroof. perfect right so just being able to monitor the car and see how actually people utilize the car they were able to come into decision well most people don't even use the sunroof so is this even efficient and effective and the answer was no and so therefore they were able to get rid of the sunroof and get rid of the idea that we think, well, everybody will want a sunroof, right? Everybody's going to open it and use the sunroof. And the reality was nobody was using a sunroof. And so, okay, let's get rid of the sunroof and make it easy to manufacture. Imagine cutting a hole out in the vehicle and then having a convertible hole in the top of the vehicle versus just making it a hard top across the board, right? So amazing. But you only get that information from in-field. Sunroofs for a while. <clears throat> um, Let's go here. Module and local. Leveraging vertical integration. So air suspension, they were able to increase the air suspension by utilizing the modules from the GPS and autopilot compute in order to make better decisions when it came out to suspension and how they were utilizing it. Man, guys, 
This is why these cars are basically robots on wheels. But let's continue. It's full self-driving. And 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 this is funny because it it greatly improved from the past, right? Architecture for generalized vision system, and so they're able to take a 360 perspective of the car and stitch these together, and then also process that with a computer or a brain that's able to make decisions inside of the real world, real time. Motion, you can see that it precisely captures the swervy, violent motion of this truck next to us, and this helps the planning system to avoid a collision with this object. Look at that. So the computer was able to catch that and actually be able to change course, all from vision, right? Versus from LIDARs and radars and everything like that. It was vision, mainly the same way that we detect the same obstacle or issue on the road, right? And so using state-of-the-art AI for modeling, and so, of course, they changed a couple ways. So I kind of just wanted to show a little bit of this just so you guys can see, like, how much progress is being made. And uh, one of the amazing things also, I'm going to let you guys see this, is that Tesla did come out with a humanoid robot, and they decided to kind of push in this direction. And so this is the video kind of seeing the progress of that. And you could take the real world artificial intelligence in a car moving at 60 miles per hour. The only thing is the body is in four wheels, a form of four wheels, and put it in a humanoid. And for the robot to make decisions, right, to have the mind and the brain to be able to move in the real world when it's driving 60 miles per hour on the road is fascinating. And if you put it in a humanoid form, it's way more simplistic than driving at a road at 60 miles per hour. That's why you usually as an adult, right? You could be a, a human at any time, right? Like when you're eight, five, six, you, you can navigate the world. Okay. But it's not until you're like 16, 14 or 15 or whatever, you have to be older in order to start to get your driving permit, a permit, right? You got to be navigating in the world and understand the world a little bit more. We don't issue out driver's license for kids that are eight years old. But shout out to Thailand, kids be out here riding scooters to the grocery store uh, at the age of freaking seven, you know? So that's just the difference about how we work in the West sometimes. But uh, here's the update of the humanoid robot. And so Elon has made the decision to place in Tesla, has made the decision to place that artificial intelligence, that real world artificial intelligence inside a humanoid robot. Introduce uh, Elon back on stage uh, to give some more updates. Say it's coming back on stage. Give it some time. Yeah, this is the next day's video. So here we go. We're going to go see this computer video. It's kind of weird seeing the arms and legs just separate. We have a whole lab full of arms and legs. Worth bearing in mind that uh, when we did AI Day, uh, this version of Optimus didn't work, work at all. So the rate of improvement here, I think, is, is quite uh, significant. Um, it's obviously not doing parkour, uh, but uh, it is walking around. And we have multiple, multiple uh, copies, I suppose, of Optimus. Um, The thing that I think Tesla brings to the table that others don't have is that we have um, we have the uh, real world AI. We're, we're the most advanced in real world AI. So the same AI that drives the car, uh, it, which you can think of the car really as a robot on wheels. And this is a robot on legs. Um, Basically, right? So understanding the market growth for actually having that as an option as a company to basically have certain particular jobs automated to robots is ridiculous. And 
the market for that is, you know, just exponential. And, and what makes actually Tesla vastly different from things like Boston Dynamics is that um, there's psycho motor skills, psycho meaning psychological and motor meaning like hardware and physical. And so when you look at Boston Dynamics, a lot of people see the value of the robot dancing and doing a backflip. But uh, uh, practicality and its utilization in the real world, most humans don't do backflips. So as much as Boston Dynamics looks advanced and the computers are able to move, they have amazing hardware, no doubt. But when it comes to the psycho side, the psychological side, the software, the operation of those robots is little to none. And a lot of things need to be programmed. So in a situation like that, that needed to be programmed by a computer programmer versus real world artificial intelligence where the computer was moving in that. And it didn't have to be programmed to go left and go right and then do a dance like you see with Boston Dynamics. It is actually utilizing that brain and solving real world problems as it moves through the world. No different than when it's on the four wheels driving in the form of a car. And so with that being said, it's a, it's, it's a big difference, right? And so as much as Boston Dynamics has did great things with the hardware, um, software is the side where the tremendous value is being created. And also not only that, even on the hardware side of things, Boston Dynamics did amazing. Once again, I'm not trying to say that they're a terrible company and they don't play their part in the advancement of robotics. But what I am saying is that the way they built out their robots is not prioritized or even balanced with productivity and mass production. So even though they build robots, the hardware is built more so for research and scientific development, more so with production at the forefront of it. So how will we mass produce these robots? And so Boston Dynamics, while their robots might look amazing to mass produce those type of robots is a production nightmare versus Elon himself and Tesla as an organization has the experience to also be able to build out products and services that keep massive amounts of production and scaling in mind in the design of it. And so therefore the autonomous robot or humanoid is built already to be something that can be scaled, that can be mass produced and also in it being mass produced. It is also produced in a way that gives you a realistic affordable price. $25,000, $40,000 per humanoid. And that is just a projection. But net net, how much does a robot of this caliber that you see doing the backflips cost? Massive amounts of money. And even if you had unlimited funds, it would not be able to scale because the production and assembly line still needs to be built out. Where Tesla has already built, built this humanoid robot with that in mind. Right, it has been built for mass production. Just like some items are built, but not for the masses, for it to be a limited supply of the complications on how it's built. Doesn't mean it can't be reduced. It doesn't mean that there's a more effective, efficient way. There definitely is, but that's just how the company operated. So, with that being said, uh, Tesla has, of course, a history of executing this, whether it's came from lithium ion refining, whether it came from cars, EVs, where it came from batteries, producing batteries, right? And for the energy department, right? Producing also artificial intelligence in their data centers. I mean, they have <laughs> producing their factories, gigafactories. They have an in-house way of doing construction. Prior to that, all the construction of the manufacturing facilities and factories of all car companies were outsourced to subcontractors. Tesla has its own in-house way of building gigafactories with larger space per square foot per building or square foot of the building, larger than any other factory and facility in the world, but more quicker and more faster to construction and completion time. And so they have this ability to move through any process, whether it's building an actual factory, building a lithium ion refinery facility, whether it's building a robo fleet or humanoid robots 
all the way down to the energy department of getting in any type of process and being able to create a more effective and efficient practice and how to bring that product and service to market. So it's just a skill set that they have and a culture that they have. And this is why I'm always harping on the value of Tesla it stands way beyond EV. Um, currently, you're just going to wait and see the other areas that they move in when you see the revenue start to come in. Let's go back down to this uh, quarterly cost sheet because, you know, I definitely was going to get on my preaching mode with the investor today, which is great. Our cost of goods sold per vehicle decreased to $37,000 in quarter three. While production costs at our new factories remain higher than our established factories, right? We have implemented necessary upgrades in Q3 to enable further unit cost reduction. So we continue to believe that an industry leader needs to be a cost leader. I, I couldn't agree more. Shout out to Henry Ford, what he brought to the market. Um, as you see, we're going to get into a little bit of the cash. Operating cash flow is $3.3 in quarter three. So this is a good amount of cash flow, guys, right? Uh, three point, no, three point zero billion increase in our cash and investments quarter over quarter to twenty six point one billion. So shout outs to the overall picture in the cash flow. And let's go back to the tax, right? Um, during a high interest rate environment, we believe focusing on investments in research and development and capital expenditure for future growth. So that's a good strategy, right? Um, while there is a high interest rate, right? Um, it's going to reduce the customer's ability to purchase said product and service. So it's good for the company not to focus on trying to convince people during a hard time of high interest rates to buy more Teslas, but to focus inward on research and development and capital expenditure, possibly facilitating um, your ability to reduce the cost, right? So even if the interest rate is higher, um, a lower price would be nice. And hence why our operating margins are currently down, because Tesla can also be flexible to a market condition. See, unlike other automakers, which don't have room or margins to actually be able to change or reduce their price in a dramatic way due to macroeconomics, Tesla has more flexibility and um, that's going to provide more competition for them against competitors. So as we go back, right, capital expenditure while maintaining a positive cash flow is the right approach. Year to date, our free cash flow reached 2.3 billion while our cash and investment positions continue to improve. We have more than doubled the size of our AI training compute to accommodate for our growing data sets, as well as our Optimus robot project, our humanoid robot, is currently being trained for simple tasks through AI rather than hard coded software. And its hardware is being further upgraded. And of course, that's the same comparison as, like I said, Chat GPT. They're using the same or similar training models in order to increase its efficiency. Let's go to, let's go to Elon for a little bit. Um, so as we solve real world AI, and I don't think there's any, I don't think there's anyone even close to Tesla on solving real world AI. Um, that same computer and software uh, goes into Optimus. And I would agree. I would definitely agree with that. I don't think anyone else is close. Um, even if there was someone close, it would be Mobileye, which is owned by, I believe, Samson. And so they'll be way more close, but still, I don't think they're quote, close, and I'm not going to argue against their method of using LIDAR. That's a whole different conversation. Operations, right? So let's go 40 gigawatts of energy storage deployed in quarter three, a more than double AI training compute. And lastly, with a combined gross profit generation of over 0.5 billion in Q3, our energy generation and storage business and service and other businesses have become meaningful contributors to our profit profitability, right? And so that's been amazing. Unfortunately, it's gross profit and not net profit, but net net is still okay. You know, you can't have everything, right? Um, that industry or that aspect just needs more time to grow. As you can see, we can look at the quarters throughout the years, uh, starting back from last year, right? Quarter three of 2022, you can see the growth from the energy department. And so it's doing 
fairly good. And as you look over here, year over year, we have a 40% increase. So this is goodness, goodness. 32% increase on services and other revenue. So this is also good. We're building out other modules, right? And of course, realistically, the total automotive revenues have grown by 5%, better than none. And so Tesla has been able to build out other different types of models to generate cash flow, to bring in revenue, right? And they have been increasing over the year by 40 and 32% in each of those sectors. Uh, 40 for the energy generation and storage revenue, and then services and other revenue, 32%. So this is good. You know, a lot of money that goes into Amazon now is not mostly from uh, the actual business that we know of when we buy products, right, on the marketplace on Amazon, but mostly from AWS, which will be categorized as service and other revenue underneath Amazon. So it, it, it's a great progress in the right direction. Of course, the revenue and the profitability is here um, as we just go into it, right? Operating income decreased 1.2 or 1.8 billion in quarter three, resulting in a 7.6 operating margin and a reduced ASP due to pricing and mix increase in operating expenses driven by Cybertruck, AI and other research developments or projects, cost of production ramp and idle costs related to factory upgrades and negative FX impact. And then the positives, growth in the vehicle de deliveries, a lower cost per vehicle, which is good, and gross profit profit growth in energy generation and storage, as well as services and others, and growth in regulatory credit sales. So shout outs to us selling credits to other people, right? Because we're reaching our goals. A lot of people like to use that against Tesla, but it's actually something that, you know, is beneficial. Um, if we're able to exceed the goals of government regulations and have credits left afterwards, then, you know, completely fine. As you see, Model S and Model 3, uh, Model S mainly down about 31 percent. And if we move into Model 3, which is a more realistic model, 20 percent. But overall, for both of those types, it's 18 percent. Total deliveries overall, with all models included, is a 27 percent increase year over year. So we're doing relatively okay. You know, nothing we can complain about. Uh, issue about solar deployed, this is an issue, but most of it is really coming as of right now from the storage generation. So whether any nation or industry already has its way of actually generating energy, coal, nuclear, uh, solar, et cetera, gas, whatever, still, all of that still needs a battery to be managed with. So that's where we come in and excel. So definitely that aspect of it is has has more promise than the solar. Solar is going to take a while for people to catch on, but it's super effective and highly efficient. I mean, it is cheaper as the way to generate energy. So it's going to take that time for that to actually play out. But net net storage is still something that can be solved today and be implemented with any form of energy generation. Tesla the locations. Uh, mobile service fleet, supercharged stations, and this is a good one, and connectors, right? 31% and 31%. So let's a little bit move into it. Uh, let's go back to the Investor's Day back in 2023, even though we're in quarter three of 2023 still. Let's go to the Investor's Day. Hi there. My name is Rebecca Tanucci, and I lead our charging infrastructure teams here at Tesla. And at Tesla Charging, we have understood since day one that a great charging experience is the linchpin to electric vehicle adoption. And that understanding has meant that we've always taken a holistic approach to charging. That's a word that you've heard a lot here today, but what it means for charging is that we've considered every use case. We think a lot about what it means to charge at home, even if that home is an apartment or condo. And we spend a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to charge away from home, including if that's for daily commuting or if you're going on a road trip. And this holistic approach has led to some pretty incredible results. In 2022, we provided nine terawatt hours of charging across our various charging methods. Over 50% of that was supplied via convenient AC home charging. And when our customers are away from home, they can visit one of our 80,000 charging points. That includes 40,000 of our beloved superchargers. And one of the things that recently came up with superchargers is BP done 
uh, did a deal recently of a hundred million with Tesla uh, towards their actual supercharging network and business model. So that's great news for Tesla once a, once again. Tesla, right ahead of the rest of the pack. Um, you know, superchargers and the network has been something that they worked on for a long time. And so it's just nothing but amazing to actually see it done. Let's go back to the deck, right? Let's go to the quarterly deck. Uh, artificial intelligence, core technologies in here. We're going to be talking about, uh, oh, so here we go. Vehicle, right? Capacity. We have our factories in the California, Nevada, and Texas. Um, we have factories in China, in Europe, in Berlin. And as you see down here on this graph, uh, the majority of the vehicles are coming from the USA, right? And so with that being said, guys, it's a USA company built, manufactured all in America. So if you have any ounce of patriotism or made in America, bring jobs back, if you're a part of that camp, then this is where you actually vote with your dollar. How many other cars are manufactured in the United States? Some are not. Of course, majority of are like GM and Ford. But I just wanted to bring that to you so you can understand. Core technology, artificial intelligence, and software and hardware, right? And so you see that a software uh, that safely performs tasks in the real world is key of our AI development efforts. And so they've been growing that model out, getting more effective and efficient. But as you can see, the cumulative miles driven by FSD beta um, as of, let's say, September 2023, we're in the millions. 500, we're close catching up to 600 million, 600 million miles driven by FSD beta. That's a lot of data, guys, right? Nobody's close to that because, of course, Google or Waymo or whatever company that exists, they're utilizing modules, which there's like a software team there and they're sitting in, they're in a ge geo fence area and they got things mapped out and they're doing surveys and people are hired and da, 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 da. Versus Tesla just has all its fleet utilized even with customers to actually do it. A vehicle and other software, all Tesla rentals through Hertz in the US and Canada now allow Tesla apps access, allowing renters to use key, key lists, lock and unlock via phone key remotely, precondition the cabin, track, charge status and more and customers who already have a tesla profile will have the settings and preference seamlessly applied so basically tesla has done another deal also with hertz and so this is good news now also they did a hardware deal meaning acquiring their cars now this is more pertaining to operating how hertz will operate their rental cars and there's a software play where the tesla app would be able to access those vehicles and do certain things of the hurt rental vehicles so that is a further integration towards that joint venture between hertz and tesla battery and powertrain manufacturing right despite macro headwinds our planned factory shutdowns in quarter three an ongoing ramp of new factories our average vehicle cost was thirty seven thousand dollars for reduced right thirty thirty seven five hundred and 37,500, let me be clear. <laughs> we continue to work to reduce the cost further. And in four very heavy vehicles, a high voltage powertrain architecture brings notable cost savings, which is why the Cybertruck will adopt a 800 volt architecture. So once again, all that infrastructure for the architecture for electric work and the powertrain, it all comes to play. Other highlights, this is the one we were talking about, right? Is the energy storage. Look at that deployment, right? Energy storage to the right. You got the gigawatts per hour as you see the increase steadily over the years from 2017 all the way to 2023. Now we actually have a workable model, right? Now we have an actual factory in California producing these bad boys. Uh, have you guys seen it? The battery factory? Um, battery factory Tesla and CA. Lothorpe or something like that. Now, Gigafactory is where the cars come from, right? But a mega factory for the mega packs and batteries and storage of energy that comes from a mega factory. Here we go.
let's let's go back to that highlight right the largest utility scale battery factory in the entire north america Made on Earth by humans. So ten thousand megapacks units per year, which will be ramped. Come join us at Tesla, guys. I'm the only place I will work is Tesla. So still putting in my application. They haven't hired me yet. But uh if I did more networking, I could make it happen. Solar, solar deployments, not that great, right? Uh historically, but still uh, we're trying to work it out. Services and other businesses, right? For the vast majority from 2017 leading all the way up to 2022, um, it's been an issue. But now we have some profit, right? And then as our global fleet gr grows in size, right, our service and other businesses continue to grow successfully with supercharging insurance and body shop and part sales being the core drivers of profit growth. Year over year, pay per use supercharging remains a profitable business for the company, even as we scale capital expenditure. Our team is focused on materially expanding supercharging capacity and further improving the capacity uh, management in anticipation of other OEMs joining our network and which other groups and car companies have. So this is this is all good news, right? Volume, and we are planning to grow production as quickly as possible in alignment with a 50% CAGR target. And we began guiding in the early of 2021. And so guys, as you see, there's massive amounts of growth. Uh, we got photos here. And let's see, Model Y starting price exclusive of national and state level subsidies. So inclusive. So it's included with it. And as you see, uh, all right, so, okay, so Chicago and Colorado um, is where you can get it fairly cheap because of the state incentives or subsidies. Um, but the rest of the places they're highlighting, just showing you where you can go, right? Shout out to the cyber truck and also the semi. So as you can see, semi toting there. I mean, guys, this is the future. This is the factory in California, the mega pack factory, right? Where we're producing at 40 gigawatts per year. Giga factory in Shanghai, one millionth Model Y produced. So thanks out there. And Ni Hao to my folks out there in China. Shout outs to them. Uh, we really appreciate it. And as you see, we're looking at key metrics. As you can see, vehicle deliveries are growing up steadily from 2020 to 2023. Of course, even previously that you see the free cash flow and the operating cash flow, which is all right. Right. We're doing all right. We're doing all right. And net income adjusted for EBITDA. And we're doing relatively good over there also. So financials are looking good. Uh, volumes, vehicle deliveries, millions of units. As you can see right here, we're doing good. Uh, operating cash flow and free cash flow, we're doing good. We're not losing, guys. Look at the operating margin, right? Look at the, all right, so let's go to year-over-year -year revenue growth, right? Look at Tesla and then auto industry and S&P 500, right? They're down here underneath 10 or around 10, right? We're up here growing to 70, coming back down to 30, but we're still in the lead. Operating margin, this is a big one right here, right? Look at Tesla, look at auto industry and S&P 500. We're up there with the S&P 500. But look at the rest of the auto industry, around about eight, right? And we were reducing ours because of the macros. We got the finances here. So that's something that you guys can dig through, right? Go through the statement, see the cash flow, right? See the net income. 
and all that information is provided, right? And that kind of ends out the update, right? And so in the macro, it's doing relatively good. Uh, there's a massive amounts of people that are complaining about how Elon conducted the meeting and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, once again, let's just go down to the details and that let's let's not end up like Kevin, right? Just kind of saying that car is a joke because of our lack of knowledge and understanding about that car company. Uh, let's break down some of this more in Investor's Day and then we'll end it at the actual hour mark. Oh, wait. We're at 45. Yeah, so we're at 45. So this is definitely something that you guys can go check. Um, this is amazing as you see the supply chain, tier one parts and tier two parts, right? So what's required, right? So as you can see, it's scaling. As you see, the things are taking their time to be built out, which is good, right? As you see, the most powerful in-vehicle compute you know, 7K components between each component assembled, right? We have a 1.4. We have a 95% reduction in labor to make this part, right? I mean, we're just moving forward. Moving forward in many ways. As you can see, the inbound complexity, we got uh, 16 million pallets and racks received in 2022. Uh, 1 billion electronic components shipped each week. And then global service locations, 682, 85, excuse me, in 45 countries. And so this is this is very interesting, right? And supply chain hell is a real issue. And so the global shortage and everything that seemed to be a problem was something that Tesla was able to adapt and overcome. Scale against the odds, man, right? Thousands of vehicles right here. And even though we have these quote unquote shortages, Tesla is able to utilize its edge on the industry to adjust. Semiconductor industry can support our growth. So for Tesla, Tesla with FSD hardware uses more semiconductors than an ICE vehicle, right? And so with that being said, we have to be able to secure those actual semiconductors in the chips. So this is something that it does. And so evolution of heat pump line, as you can see, Manual, right? Semi automated, simulated to automate it, right? And so prior, it was manually put together, as you see in the top right hand corner, and then eventually being fully automated. I mean, I'm just loving it, right? This is goes all to efficiency, efficiency, automation, and cost, right? This is the deep dive into what makes it a good business, not just what we see on the news, right? Manufacturing is the best technology that uh, Tesla has to offer. Their way of going about the actual manufacturing process is ridiculous. As you can see, what it takes to ramp a gigafactory, right? And the labor and the cost of energy and the time, right? So 90% overall equipment efficient effectiveness, excuse me, in 45 second cycle time. So this is how we just improve across the board. And what you're not going to get is many companies being able to do that. As you can see, strength and feedback loop between manufacturers and services. So what is that communication? In the last six months, right, time and service reduction, 11%. Early service reduction, 16%. Service appointment wait time reduction, 9%. So it takes a while to get service. We're reducing that time by 9%. New factories. Here we go. Austin, Berlin, Shanghai, Fremont. Right, Tesla vehicle footprint. We're looking at a factory, a build out, right? Simplicity up, right? Investment down, scale up. So we got the Fremont, we got the GFTX 4680, and then we got the typical 2170. So they're talking about the battery at this point. Let's go this. This is important 50 gigawatts. Right? In Corpus Christi, lithium ion refinery. So, this is already broken ground, and this is going to be tremendous. This is going to be amazing. And they're good at it, guys. As you can see with the factories, they were good. And so, financials, uh, question and answers, all of this is provided in that. But guys, I'm telling you, this is why Tesla is the future.
This is why I heavily invested in Tesla and I still will continue to do the same. And I'll continue to do these reviews on Tesla when the quarterly reports come out, put out some good positive information about Tesla so you guys can know about the company that also I'm invested in largely. And also at the same time, still just understand what it looks like for an individual to be invested in an individual stock and for them to know about the individual stock. And shout outs to 1MT. But when I did have my interview with him one on one um, financial consultation, it was one thing that he challenged me on. But I was able to back it up with information and data and what about the company I was invested in, how the company operated, other models of revenue and growth and be able to provide that to be able to articulate the value that was at that time and then also the value that I see in the future with the company. And so as long as you understand the complexities of the company and understand how the company operates front to back, then definitely it's a interesting endeavor versus ETX and mutual funds and excuse me, ETFs and mutual funds. But also they hold their value and I do also invest in those as a counter balance to being heavily invested in one specific stock. And so for the next 10 to 20 years, I'm completely done with reinvesting in Tesla unless I just get some extra cash from a couple of projects. But most of my money was just go into traditional FTX or excuse me, ETFs and mutual funds, right? And spread them out and diversify my risk and start generating also stocks that have income. And we'll talk about that in another one. The Income Factory is a book that I'm reading to change my strategy and build a new model and keep my old models, but build out a new form and a new model called the Income Factory, which you purchase stocks to generate cash, monthly dividends, and being able to build out that dividends. Not only do you also get the capital appreciation or the value appreciation from the stock, but you also get the actual generation of income, which gives it another form of growth versus most stocks when people purchase from Apple and blue chip companies, they offer no dividends. And so with that being said, they only get the market appreciation. And in real estate, you get what? Cash flow, equity, debt pay down and tax reduction. And for stocks, most people invest in a similar module with upper management or financial institutions or institutional money where it's all depicted on the actual market value of the stock changing versus on an individual basis as a human and an individual investor, you need to build out one like that if you want to, um, ETFs and mutual funds, and then also another vehicle, which would be income generating portfolio where it has dividends. And still, even if the stocks go down, unlike most of you guys, if I invest in Apple and my stock goes up and down and one minute I'm 50,000 up the next minute, um, you know, 30,000 down. It's okay. Right. We're talking about long-term investors, but during all that long-term investing, there's no cash coming back and it generates no money and it's all appreciation or capital appreciation play. And you could do that in real estate, but most people advise from it, right? Get a cash flow play, get positive cash flow. Um, not only for the appreciation that you can get for being in a good area and hoping that the real estate improves overall, or be worth more. And so building that type of module out in the stock market area is very interesting. And so imagine if my, you know, my portfolio is volatile due to Tesla. And so if I have the other portfolio, which, yeah, it went down by 10 grand, not as volatile, but even when it goes down and has the value uh, reduced for the time being, once again, long term, 10 years, 20 years later, it will play out. During the 10 to 20 years of it playing out, I have income being generated from it. So that also has value overall to the growth of the actual stock. So you still get paid out dividends, even when some most dividend companies are in a dip on their stock price. So it, it, it's a great book. It's definitely good. And this is what you do in retirement. You kind of just make sure that your overall perspective and your estate planning is being done. Build out new formats. Um, make it more solidified, even though it's solidified now, for a large part, if Tesla went under, there would be massive amounts of devaluation of my overall estate. And um, I wouldn't care. I definitely would be able to get it back. There's other techniques. I'm not worried. Um, I would just have to work at it and go back at it. 
but also why not in the meantime still shore up those other avenues right still shore up that ability to be able to build out that diversified etf and mutual funds investing for the 20 years a contribution of 200 dollars every month for the next 20 years that's a play towards 600 seven hundred thousand dollars that's completely reasonable right so now for the next 20 years i have seven hundred thousand dollars built out as a play so if I take that and I extrapolate backwards for 20 years, that's $35,000 a year, which makes it to be $3,000 a month. So might as well run that play with only a $200 investment for the 20 years. $200 investment, excuse me, 12 times is 2,400 times 20 would be $50,000. So these are some good strategies. And of course, that's exaggeration slightly. So give or take or a big chunk, 100 to 200 K. But still on the macro, it's a great growth, 11, 8 percent, as we saw in the S&P 500. And so that's a good form. And then also building out another portfolio that's based on the dividends in which I told you about the portfolio that has the dividend stock that generates the income. Guys, this is what estate planning looks like you just thinking about the long term sitting back re-strategizing um not basically abandoning my old ways and saying oh that's stupid i shouldn't have did it like that but building up another module another portfolio once again not having wage not wage stagnation but asset stagnation and so it goes even in the same type of investment vehicles being securities and stocks um, there's different types of modules and portfolios that you can build out and each account addresses a specific thing that you're building out towards your approach to the market. One is a dividend account. Another is a capital contribution for the long term, like a 410k S&P 500, 8% uh, growth rate for the next 20 years strategy. And another account is just I like these companies. Not only do I like these companies, I think these companies will be worth tremendous value in the future. And I'm placing my chips in, in calculated investment on these companies for the next 20 to 30 years. Those are three different portfolios, three different accounts that you hold, all dressed in the stock market, but in different ways. And that is estate planning. Shout outs to everybody. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being here for a whole hour. Shout outs to my wealth warriors. I put a lot into it. Um, meaning this installment, just because I wanted to provide that extra minute, uh, extra growth. I'm going to take that last part and probably clip it and provide that in a short format also, where it just talks about the state planning overall, because I think it's actually beneficial, whether you have a family, whatever that's your thing to handle. But net net at the end of the day, this is something that needs to be in the lexicon and the actual repertoire of a lot of you guys. Um, especially here on Wealth Warriors, it would be beneficial for you guys to understand that. So shout outs to everybody. See you on the next installment. I'm going to be dropping an installment with my brother. We did a video. I'm going to get it from him, upload it on the Patreon. Then, guys, give me some comments. Hit me up in the chat privately, criticizing me about the both of us so I can build that out to be a little bit better. And um, once again, appreciate it. Love you guys. Stay strong. Keep doing what you're doing. Shout outs to everybody in my Wealth Warriors. Peace, peace.